All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Miked Up Outdoors. I am your host, Josh Tanner, and with me today is a good friend of mine, Mr. Benjamin Nowak, uh, fishing extraordinaire, small mouth, <laughs> small mouth, like whisper, and uh, new bait maker. Yeah, new bait maker. New bait maker. No, so, thank you for having yeah, me. We've yeah, we've talked man. about this for a while. Like we talked before this, but we've like tried to link up and it's yeah. hard when you're we, trying to yep. coordinate schedules and make it all yeah, happen. Man. So I'm glad it's, we finally get just, together. It's tough. You got new little ones and I've got old, old ones. And <laughs> we're just like, I, I kind of relate this to like, you're like level one family and I'm like level three yeah. family, you know, yeah. in moving towards retirement age and you're just kind of getting started with it. But anyway, man, thanks for coming on today. I appreciate you coming over and sitting down with me in the, yeah. in the, studio and uh giving it a go today so i'm excited yeah this is really cool yeah so for those of you that don't know ben uh ben is a resident here in the state of michigan he lives in the central michigan area um you and i linked up probably what five years ago it might even been longer maybe a little bit longer and that was all through um my son thad who when he started in kind of the filming youtube game we got linked up through a mutual friend who put yeah. me in touch with you or put T- Thad in touch with you. And then uh, the friendship just kind of grew from there. And I mean, I love what you're doing. I love the fishing that you're doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I was, I love fishing for bass, but you taught me to fish for smallmouth, which took it to an entirely different level for me, which was so exciting. And I mean, I love doing it. I just don't seem to be able to get enough time to do it anymore. I, but. I remember the first time we went smallmouth fishing on the yeah. bay. Yeah. And uh, like we had talked about it before we went and you showed up with like this nine foot steelhead rod. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, that's what I, no, I'm a steelhead fisherman. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and Thad and I were kind of like just messing with you. Like you're not going to catch anything on that. It's yeah. the wrong rod. It's <laughs> the wrong gear. And you catch the biggest fish of the day, which <laughs> there is something to be said about your ability to catch big fish. And I talked with Alex about this, yeah. but like, Guys that catch big fish regularly, like there's something about their approach on the water that catches big fish, but it, it's always like a running joke. Josh won't catch the most. No, fish. I will definitely not. He'll get like three bites a day, and right. one of them's the biggest. One fish of them's in the a trips. good one, but that's not always the case. So let's not like <laughs> let's not let's not make me out something that I don't think I am. But like that particular day, yeah, I was just I like, just well, this is what I got. Yeah. This is what I'm going to use, and and uh, whatever bait you got. I'll try it, and yeah, I ended up catching a smallmouth. That was literally like my first smallmouth, and it was five it was, fourteen, I think. It was almost six pounds. Yeah, it was almost six pounds. Five. It was somewhere. It was over five pounds, and it was incredible. Yeah. The thing was a freaking dinosaur. Yeah. So anyway, but so I guess just to kind of give everybody a little bit of a backstory, just tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, and you know. Just a little bit of backstory so people have an idea on who you are and where you came from and where yeah, you're at. For sure. So um obviously like you mentioned, my name is Benjamin Noah, yep. but I grew up in Michigan. So okay. resident of mid Michigan my entire life. Got into fishing. Um man, I don't even know when. Like it's always been a part of what my family does, but we've never been like no one in my family was a bass fisherman. Okay. They just like to fish. So my aunt had a cottage on Lake 13 in Clare. Mm-hmm. And then my grandparents had a cottage on Sugar uh, okay. up in Gladwin. Up on Gladwin, north of Gladwin. Yep. 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 And uh, so we just go fish off the pontoon. And then I got really involved in hockey and lacrosse okay. and every other What sport. age was that? Probably teen, nine. Te- okay. Or yeah, pre-teen. Nine pre-teen. or ten, I okay. got like really involved. Like I was okay. just constantly playing hockey. So like all year long, I was right. playing hockey. And then I got involved in other sports and right. got out of fishing. I didn't right. fish probably... More than a couple times from 10 to so even 17. So like even in like the summer months, you were playing hockey? I was playing hockey. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, yeah. I had this goal that I was going to go pro playing hockey. Sure. Right? And sure. five foot six goalie, it just doesn't go well for <laughs> you. You know? Like, there's a little, there's a little, yeah, there's a little like the logistic, not logistics, but just the, I don't know what the word is. Genetics. Genetics. You're, you're born, there it is. Yeah. yeah. You're born, yeah. you know, maybe yeah. not the right height. But when I got into college, I watched um, on MSNBC Mike Iconelli had a show called City Limits Fishing. Okay. And he would go. And I didn't know about bass boats. I didn't know about tournaments. All I knew was this guy goes in City Limits and he goes and he catches bass. And 
like goes nuts. And right. Mike Iaconelli is crazy, right? When yeah. he catches a fish, he's For super sure. over the top, eccentric. Yep. So that's how I learned about bass fishing again. And then I started fishing off the shore at um, Sugar Springs. Yep. And the first time I was ever in a bass boat was on Lake Champlain. I signed up for FLW, like ever start, which, which is like a semi-pro. When you were a event. high schooler, or when you were in uh, col- at college, I was seventeen. Okay, so I was like going into college, or maybe my first year of college. Okay, um, and I drew Brandon Coulter, who now fishes the MLF series. Right. So he's like a bass pro, and right. uh, that was the first time I was ever in a bass oh boat. Oh my gosh! Well, from there it basically just evolved. I came home and bought. Um, a 1994 Pro Craft, which was okay. my first boat. Yep. Um, for five thousand dollars, right? Okay. Moderately, like uh, I'll take it back. Before that boat, I bought a 1989 Sylvan Sport Troller. Okay, just an aluminum footer. boat. Yep. Yep. And uh, 24, 25 horse on the back that like didn't start yeah. three quarters of the time. Sure. I, to go I owned one of those. Yeah. <laughs> it was. <laughs> It was a Johnson motor. You spent motor more time and, at the launch than you were actually on the water. Yeah, you're like yeah. on the water <laughs> and you're like paddling yourself back because you have a 12 volt trolling motor. It was right. miserable, but it was fun. Like that's how I learned. Right. Um, and then from there, I went to the Pro Craft. Okay. And uh, that's really where I started in loving bass fishing. Sure. So um, I got the Pro Craft and started fishing the Sanford Lake Bass Club, which was a thing a handful of years okay. ago. I met Andy Meyer and Steve yep. Glenn, who's like two of the. Kind of the OGs, OGs in the area. Yeah, big, big, yeah. like really well respected fishermen. You yeah. know, you also have Gary Yarborough, like the OGs of the this area of right. bass fishing. Yep. Um, and they kind of took me under their wing and mentored me and like really taught me about the sport. Yeah. Um, I know I'm like kind of going all over the place, but I got into tournament fishing and I thought that's all I wanted to do. Right. I wanted to fish pro. I wanted to go fish the opens. I wanted to go do this, that, and the other. And okay. I started college bass fishing. And that basically led me down a path of fishing tournaments, and then I saw opportunities to create content. Yeah. And uh, when you create content on local bodies of water where other guys are catching fish and you start showing spots, guys don't really like it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just got out of that and and went back to just making content, fishing, filming, and that's how I met you and how we got to where we're at now. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, it's it's been a little bit of a road, but uh, so... Why just bass fishing? Like, y- y- you could have fished for anything. Why yeah. just bass fishing? Just because that was what you had available to you? That, you know, you had, yeah. like, your aunt lived on a lake and your, your grandparents lived on a lake or whatever? I didn't know anything else. Okay. I you never got I, introduced I, I to had anything never caught, else. No, all I had caught was largemouth, crappie, bluegill, okay, and the occasional bullhead or catfish right so all just whatever was inland lake lake, yeah inland lake stuff yeah yeah and when you catch a bullhead you take that bait and you just cut it off and send the bullhead back right like that was all i knew and so then like when i saw ike and ellie doing his city limits fishing catching bass yep and then i signed up for that bass tournament i never caught a smallmouth before i went to right lake champlain right like i'm fishing a semi-pro tournament I never even seen a smallmouth. Didn't know how to tie a palomar knot. I showed up with a 1990s Berkeley cherry wood, right? And uh, like a Fenwick HM, like super old school reel. Like I had three rods. Yeah. So it was crazy, but yeah, no, I don't know. I uh, I just got like obsessed with bass fishing. Right. Like I caught some bass, and I was like, there is so much to learn, and it's been like a never ending puzzle. Yeah. And I just can't like bring myself to get into other types of fishing i think if i get into them i would enjoy them and like i'm just so focused i'm trying to figure out the next bite no and i think that i think it's good that that's what you're doing and i also think you might be shortchanging yourself because there are so many other incredible things like and we have talked about this like i am ate up with like steelhead fishing and and i love going salmon fishing and stuff but more steelhead than anything but you know, going and and you know, smallmouth fishing with you and and you know, just bass fishing, fish, bass fishing in general. Like I get, I have a problem with whatever I do. I like get engrossed in it. Yeah. So now, I'm not, I'm not good at, I'm not great at one thing. I'm moderately okay <laughs> at like twenty things, and it's it's good and bad all at the same time. But what's really interesting, you look at some of the best, best bass fishermen out there, Mm -hmm. right? They're also very good, 
multi-species angler. Right. Right. Like, uh, there's a kid, Nolan Miner, who fishes college or used to fish college, but he goes and fishes for anything. Okay. And he's so good because he understands how to read water. Yeah. Right. And Durds is also a very good trout fisherman. Yep. Yeah. Who's uh, Nathan Durdowski, who yeah. I should have probably just called him and said, get your butt over here yeah. this because he's great information. He's a great local angler, too, yeah. and a, a friend of ours and stuff. But. Anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to butt in on you there. No, but he can just, like, read water. But right. a lot of that comes from, like, how he grew up fishing and right. growing up in small streams and rivers, like trout fishing, yep. and, like, getting into it that way. And so I do believe, like, there are things I could learn, but I'm so caught up with bass. And to be honest, when I was doing this, I guess, full-time, like, when I was working for Monster Bass yep. and, and yep. doing this full-time, there came a point where I'm like, man, I don't want to go bass fishing today. Like, I just yeah. don't want to go fishing. But now when I'm back to fishing one, two, three times a month, yeah, it's like, okay, I'm going bass fishing. Like I'm going catching or I'm going like to yeah. find smallmouth on the bay yeah. or whatever. Totally, so. totally. Um, so I guess who those were the guys that taught you fishing? Like did you oh, yeah. teach yourself? I taught myself everything that I know, but like. Andy was my mentor. Okay. Like Andy put me in the back of his boat for Thursday nighters for okay. a full summer. And Steve Glenn, like I remember the morning I fished uh, the big bass bash down at the mm. Tridge okay. on Halloween. Yep. I had pulled in super, super early because I dro- drove home from up north to come fish it. Yep. Um, Steve Glenn was the second boat in the parking lot. And he sat there and like talked to me like he knew me for years. Wow. I'll never forget that. And like after that tournament, it was Steve, myself, and Andy in the parking lot just talking. Okay. And then I got introduced to bait making through those guys. Yep. They're like, hey, there's a kid named Mike Hamlin who makes jigs. Okay. They're like, you might want to learn how to make jigs. Yeah. It, it'll keep you busy through the winter and you won't have to spend as much money on baits. Sure. But like, then Andy took me in. Um, well, then Andy took on my spring break from college, took a week off to go down to Smith Mountain Lake with me. Okay. To pre-fish for a college tournament. And then he was like, hey, you want to fish out of the back of my boat this year? And so I did for a whole year. Wow. And uh, he's so good. He's so like you're like incredible. a sponge. Oh, yeah. All I mean, just the conversation and old, watching. Yeah. Just learning from Andy. Yeah. But like back then, really all Andy did was throw a jig. Okay. So like that's all I did. When right. I used to go fishing out of my Procraft, which had a, like a blown motor three-quarter of the time, like yeah. it was a jig, it was a topwater, and it was a frog. Like I would bring a, a Meyer bag mm-hmm. full of D and L jigs or do jigger jigs, yeah. which were two ninety nine at the Sanford Sports sure, Shop, sure, and a couple packs of Jigger Cross, and I'd go skip docks. Like that's all I knew how to that's do. Crazy. And uh, then I just started like looking at other stuff, and that was the last year we fished together. Yeah. Um, but we're still super close. Like I could call Andy and Steve, right, and right. those dudes are. And they're still mentors. local right now. They still fish. Oh yeah. They still fish. They a lot still of fish. Them, a they lot still of win stuff. a lot of them too. Yeah from you know what i had so um you didn't hunt I, I did for like a couple of years but hunting wasn't really what it was just just the patience it was just like level showing and up. stuff yeah. yeah and i didn't like scout it yeah. um, my uncle has a place down the road yeah um he has a big farm yep. so uh i would just go set up in his farm field right and whatever it was, i'd never shot anything right right but, it's it's interesting to me because just kind of how i grew up and like you know, my dad, it was, it was, you know, we trout fish, we bass fish, we, we hunted, we never bow hunted, but bow hunting wasn't really super, you know, nobody was really doing a ton of it back then. But to see someone like you, who is a Michigan kid that, you know, you, you, all those things were available, semi available, yeah. but you just, you just like focused in on that one thing. I think it's kind of unique, honestly, with a lot of people in, you know, just a lot of outdoors people or hunters, fishermen, in Michigan is that you're just like ultra focused on this one thing. I think a lot of it comes down to, I didn't have anyone to like show me the ropes. Yeah. It was like, yeah, we went fishing, but like, we just, you just went fishing, went fishing. Yeah. Like, yeah. You go weren't tar- pick up you those weren't, tiny, you weren't targeting any specific no, you fish. Go you just stop at the gas station down right. the road, but right by 13. Yeah. And, uh, you'd pick up like these, they were these little just jigs. tiny jigs yeah. in a little bottle cap thing. Mm-hmm. And that's what you'd fish with, with right. like tipped with a worm or yeah. like you'd fish a worm and a bobber, yeah. but that's all I knew. So that's I didn't crazy. have anyone that hunted. I didn't have anyone that like trout fished. 
It was like, go set okay. up in a boat and catch them. Yeah, which, you know what? I, I think about that, and I think, man, it is so important to, like, be a mentor to somebody Yeah. when it comes to that stuff because the things that, say, you and I take for granted, there there are kids out there, boys and girls, that, and even adults that have never had the opportunity to even try some of that stuff. You and the, there are people that will never get on the water with a fishing rod in the boat. Yeah, yeah. Right, like, which blows my mind, but... Also, like, looking back at what I came from, if we didn't have fishing rods in the boat, like, we'd have just been on the water cruising around in right. circles, part yeah. of the parade, yeah. right? right. There's a yeah. lot of people that are just cruising around in the parade. Yeah, I got a tube. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a tube. We're going to go uh, ride around yeah. on the on the pontoon today. Yeah, I couldn't imagine doing that. That's I mean, crazy. don't get me wrong. That's enjoyable it's stuff. sometimes, but, but... But it's just, it's weird that that the stuff that you and I take for granted is... is not readily available for everybody. No. And I think that with that being said, I mean, it's important to, to, you know, if you see somebody like that, even if it's just a casual conversation at a dock or a, your pier head or boat launch or something, always be available to yeah. have conversations with somebody. I mean, I'm no expert at, like I said, I'm no expert at anything, but I know enough, you know, to maybe help somebody. I'm curious, like, how did, did you kind of grow up in a family that hunted and did some fishing or like, did yes. you teach a lot of it? So with, with my dad, we, he was a gun hunter. He was, okay. a, he was a gun hunter and specifically a gun hunter. He wasn't a bow hunter. Um, and he wasn't a, he wasn't a bass fisherman. He wasn't, he wasn't really, we never bass fished at all ever. Yeah. Um, but he was a trout fisherman. That's what he grew up as a kid because he lived around a lot of creeks and, you know, places like that. So he was always trout fishing as a kid, and that's what he knew. Yeah. So when when we were young, me and my brother, he would always take us up north around uh, the Pigeon River area, and there was, like, the Pigeon River or the Black River and, you know, some of the other small creeks and, and rivers up there, and that's what we did. Like, yeah. we trout fished. When it came to the bass fishing part of it, it was just – kind of like you it was just like my buddies lived around here and like they had a a lake that we could go to we'd ride our bikes to it or or a swimming place that we you know they're like oh let's go fishing and i mean yeah i don't know it was just like you it was just like well a worm and a bobber i guess i mean there was never any technique involved whatsoever <laughs> I, yeah so that's that's all i knew about it and honestly I did a ton of bass fishing when I was in high school and stuff, but it was never like targeted and it was just, like, just local. Them, yeah. yeah. It was just local stuff. I wasn't like driving up North and I, I didn't even know what a smallmouth really was. I mean, I just like, Oh, bass is a bass. I didn't know that there was a difference in how a smallmouth reacts to certain things or, you know, compared to a large mouth. And I mean, there's a huge difference there. And honestly, it wasn't until I met you that, you kind of brought to light. It's like, oh no, there's a big difference, and there's tons of technique involved, it, which is like, it's really funny. I didn't like intentionally go out saying I wanted to learn about smallmouth. Mm -hmm. So like, I had caught probably a couple just bycatch, like going out on Wixom and Sanford and all these lakes around here that had right. them at the time. But thirteen doesn't have them. Right. Sugar doesn't have them. Yeah. A lot of the inland lakes, even those lakes that I'm talking about, like. That wasn't what Andy and I were going out to like target. Right. So I didn't learn about smallmouth till I got my Phoenix. And the only reason I decided to go to the bay was because people were so mad that I was fishing and filming on inland lakes. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm going to go learn this bay where I know there have to be big smallmouth. Sure. And I'm like, I had to learn it. And, and I'll remember uh, this forever. I uh, had no idea about the bay. Like, zero zero there was no information other than yeah. you go to the charity islands when they're right. spawning and catch them right well it was probably 10 or 12 trips going out there and there was a group of guys at the time got one bass and it was tom westoff eric petrie and mm -hmm. uh, john jaime and i messaged tom and i'm like tom i haven't caught a smallmouth in 10 trips like what am i doing wrong he's like yeah stop going to the charities launch out all gray and just fish in between the points yeah and I went out there and just graft and graft and graft. And all I knew was grass fishing. Yeah. Right. So I graft and graft. You're thinking jigs. Yeah. You know. Thinking jigs. I mean, yeah. And like I had a drop shot rigged right. up. Like I knew enough to have like a drop shot in a tube okay. or whatever. 
my very first smallmouth on the bay was caught like 4th of July. And I found it because like I had come across a grass patch, same grass patch you caught that five pound, 14 yeah. ounce fish out of. It was the very first area that I ever found out there. And I flipped into this grass patch because the water was clear and the grass was really tall at that time. Yeah. Caught a smallmouth while I was like weighing it. And I had like flipped my drop shot over the side of the boat while yeah. I was doing all this. And my rod got pulled in. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. but I didn't know anything, right? Like, right. Everything from that point was just learn, learn, like, Ta- self taught, yeah, self taught entirely. That's insane. So it was just crazy, yeah. like, just spending the amount of time on the water to learn it. And yeah, it was really yeah. cool. Yeah. So obviously, you've mentioned a little bit about taking your camera and stuff with you. Mm-hmm. So you've got a YouTube channel, yeah. Ben Nowak Fishing. Yep. Okay. Yep. It's changed once or twice. It's changed. Yeah, it's 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 <laughs> it had a couple different names ben over Ben Nowak to the Smallmouth Experience yeah. where I was gonna just target it and then it just went to like in case I want to document whatever I want to document, right. back to just Benjamin Nowak. Right, right. So. so yeah, but with that being said, you've got a how many I mean you got a ton of videos. Hundreds it's, of videos. Hundreds of videos yeah. from when you started to to where you are now. And I think initially your videos were just purely entertainment. Yeah, entirely. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it, it's just really like anybody that starts years, right? anybody that starts video YouTube this and that. You're just like putting a camera up and like, oh, I'm just gonna videotape myself. There and, wasn't YouTube fishing at the time. No, so like when I started YouTube fishing, like Mikey Balls and Brandon yep. Polinick were doing like little shorts. put a song behind it. Yeah, and just you better hammer on them because you right. need enough fish catches and cool right. footage right. to fill a song to fill up a song. <laughs> So I would go yeah. out and like catch them and I'd catch like three fish and be like, well, I can't make a video today. Then I go to my first video that I really made was out at 13. Okay. I was catching them on top water. Okay. Walking bait. Yeah. And I put behind it radioactive by Imagine Dragons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think everybody used that song oh, at one time. Yeah, it was such for a good sure. Song. It was such and a good And then I, <laughs> you know, did another one and, um, that's how I got started, and it was like just hammering. I mean, yeah. you had to catch them like quick, like quick, just just highlight reel. Yeah, yeah, essentially. Right? Yeah. And then uh, I started getting to the point where John B had like thirteen thousand okay. subscribers. Yep. And I had just started catching them on the bay, mm-hmm. and I messaged John, and he was going to come up with Peric. Yep. Before it was like before Peric had a page. Yeah, John and these guys a, that we're talking about are all guys that were young kids at the time, shit like yeah, Chicago. Have been more than sixteen, yeah, seventeen years old. Suburbs of Chicago, and they just started these YouTube channels where they were just catching bass. Well, that quickly turned into a huge. I mean, like these yeah, guys, these there was, was what four of them, five of them, you know, at yeah. the time that were just like buddies. Yeah, you had Flair, you had. Um, was there John were a couple B, of Flair, Perrick. There was a several of the guys, and they were all buddies, yeah. and they all just had their own YouTube channel, and it was primarily all bass fishing yeah, at the he, time. It was really weird because you had Mikey Balls, yep. and you had Informative Fishermen, and there were like two or three others who yeah. were like super hardcore bass anglers, yeah. getting like no views. Right. Then you had Perrick. Well, you had John B, Flair, yep. um, one rod, one reel, yep. and that might have been it. That might have been it. And yeah. those dudes were just going out and like having fun fishing. Yeah, and these were just young kids. Yeah, they're and just like hunting, had they're hunting or they're fishing like ponds, farm in the ponds, sub, and suburbs of Chicago and stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know. And uh, that's when I decided to actually start going out and like filming like vlog sure. style videos. Yeah, um, probably 2015, I think it was. Okay. Um, and that I was super dedicated to going out and filming and fishing and mm-hmm. doing like. The vlog style. It had gotten to the point. My buddy Joe Palmatier, we were tournament buddies that season. Mm-hmm. The last year that I fished tournaments pretty hard, he he turns to me and like, you enjoy making videos and, and sharing this experience more than you enjoy like competing in these tournaments, Tournament don't you? Fishing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And if I was going fishing, I was making a video. So it was about making content. So yeah. I would intentionally get the B-roll and intentionally go out and like... Yeah share the entire thing experience right. um so you weren't you weren't necessarily competitive with other fishermen you're just competitive with yourself I because just you to wanted to fish you wanted to create something that was like worthy of watching yeah i wanted yeah. to catch enough fish and a couple big fish to make a cool video yeah 
And I would go out and that was the goal. Like I have to catch three fish, three to five fish to make a cool video yeah. and like talk to the camera yeah, throughout a 10 that. to 15 minute video. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, that was the goal and, uh, it's changed a lot, but I was putting out, there was a time in that first year, I think for three months I had a video every day. That's insane. Not always just fishing, but like vlog style. Like, Hey guys, this is here. I'm fishing the team championship. Right. Like just talking. Right. I was, I have one where I was like driving and I remember I had a tripod mounted on the passenger seat. Okay. And I was like driving and just talking to the camera. Like <laughs> the first year I probably had 150 videos. That's crazy. And then, I mean, from there, like, life priorities changed. Sure. So there were some other things that went down that, like, took me away from the content creation piece. Sure. And then I really got into, like, I need to catch bass. Like, right. I want to learn how to be as good as I can be. Just ultra-focused at that point. Yeah. And there's times I wish I could get back to that same level of, like, film, enjoy the filming process, yeah. and enjoy the fishing. But, like, it's the balance is so it's hard. Tough. Yeah. So It's hard. tough. So what did you go to college for? Uh, business did, management. Did, you went to what college did you go to? Yeah, I went to Northwood University. Northwood, okay, in Midland. Yep. Okay, in Midland, Michigan. Okay. And uh, they had at the time a four-year MBA program. Okay. So three-year undergrad, one-year yep. grad school, be done. Yep. Um, and I and started that, a fishing team. At okay, Northwood. I was going to say, you created that in yeah. Northwood. Okay. Yep. All right. End of my freshman year. All right. So then I got the opportunity to fish around the country, start to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, met some people that I still talk to today yeah. through college fishing. Was college bass fishing relatively new at that time? It was super new. Yeah. Was it was say. probably only three years old. Okay. But like that was the foundation of me meeting Shea Baker. Okay. Yep. Um, because Shea and Jordan Lee were tournament par- partners and Shea was like one of the best in the country. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Jordan Lee is yeah, Jordan a professional Lee bass fisherman. Just won the event on St. Clair. Yeah. Like he is one of the best bass fishermen in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these people that we're talking about, for people, because there's probably people that yeah. are listening that have no idea. Mike Iconelli, professional bass fisherman. He's yeah. the guys that you see on TV and super, they're just great. I mean, there's a difference there. There's, these guys are like next level. Yeah, like those guys are the top pros. Like a lot of them, yeah. um, Mike Iconelli, Kevin Van Dam, like Jordan yeah. Lee. Yeah. These guys are the best in the world. Right. They're professional anglers who make a living bass fishing and not right. just like make money bass fishing right like really yeah. make money like really make money so yeah. yeah so you went for your business degree yep and it, that was at that time that you picked up your first camera no i didn't pick up a camera until i was done with school oh okay. i graduated in august and okay. i picked up a camera uh, maybe i'd picked it up like once or twice like okay. a gopro mounted it on sure. the back of the boat whatever. i think that's what everybody who started youtube yeah. started with was a gopro yeah or something close to it. I think mine was like some knockoff GoPro. It was like $40. <laughs> yeah. It lasted 15 minutes, and you're like, woo. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's the greatest. Yeah, I, think I, have, I think I still have one of those yeah. in the boat somewhere. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. just in case one of these goes down. Like, I better have this. I got 10 there. minutes worth of video and battery power out of this. Sucker, yeah. So, anyway, but no. Uh, so, you, you were doing some video stuff after college. So, yeah. and you were you still co- like so, fishing college tournaments at that time when you, I mean, you, uh, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of just local tournaments. Okay, I got started with the camera at ten, age of ten. Okay, so like growing up, I had this fascination with movies. Okay, like I loved movies, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings. Sure, I remember sitting down to a Harry Potter movie, and I literally watched the entire thing and wrote the entire script. And Get like out of multiple here. Multiple notepads. Are you shitting me? Really? I was a nerd, man. I was such a nerd. But I was so fascinated with movies. That's next would, like, like, Let's take it into another it was, level. Like, it was really weird. <laughs> like, it was really weird. But I would, like, note different shot patterns. Right. Well, my mom was like, man, you like movies. And I, like, tried to write video scripts. Yeah. And so she worked with Darcy Brown, who is okay. Jason Brown's wife. Okay. Well, at this time, so Jason Brown owns... Um, well, at the time, it was Rusted it, Rooster. It was Jack Pine Productions. Okay, Jack Pine Productions. Then turned yep. into Rack Focus Media, then yep. turned into Rusted Rooster. And now right. it's... And now it's, it's Be Alive, Be I Alive, think. Be Alive yeah. Studios or something. So, yeah, for those that don't know Jason Brown, he's another local prodigy yeah. in our area. He's from the Beaverton area. Started up, you know, just had a fascination with filming and stuff. Went to college. I think he went to Ferris. Ferris? Yeah, maybe. I feel like he went to Ferris. Um, you and I both know him, but... you. He started up his own production company and, you know, 
and his was more in the the hunting space, yeah. the hunting media space. But you got in touch with him. I got in touch with him that. when he was doing weddings. Okay. And he was doing like photo montage videos, which was a big thing when like in the early two thousands. Yeah. Right? Like where you'd literally take a f- film camera. Right. And you'd take a photo and set it on like a camera stand and you'd have it on then you put the next photo. Yeah. Take a pic take a video of it. Three yeah. second video. Three second video. And then you'd put them all together with some music in the background. Right. Like physical photos because you didn't really have digital photos right. at the time. Right. Well, that's what, that was how I learned. And uh, then I hooked up with Jason again my senior year of high school. Okay. Uh, as like an intern. Okay. Um, and I worked for him when he was starting with the Kiefer's. Yep. Kiefer Brothers. Yep. The Kiefer Brothers yep. who are now like part of Be Alive. Like they're Correct. co-owners of Be yep. Alive with Jason. But they had just prep they were prepping for the first season to drop dropped now looking yep. back hindsight's 2020 but i was in the room and like wish i had been more involved yeah. and to like be a fly on the wall is dropped season one yeah because that know? was really like they were cool. just playing that was it. really quite revolutionary at the time yeah nobody was doing what these those guys were doing or yeah. planning to do i should say and i still so. remember like those guys were just meeting with Jason and like starting to build rapport and they yeah. were like coming over more and more. And it was yeah. really cool to and see the and process. You're, and you're just, and I'm sitting, sitting in this office, dude, I can remember the way the studio laid out. My office was probably, you know, a 10 by 10 room with a yeah. computer in the corner and a disc burner because yeah. all you had were CDs. Right. So my job was to burn CDs. So I'd take discs and put them in this five to eight rack thing, oh put the master in and like change it hundreds of videos <laughs> and then like right there that wall jason and the keepers were having meetings and i'm like waiting on this disc burner like throwing yeah. the ball up in the air or like editing videos because yeah. jason was still doing wedding videos at the time so right. i was helping him edit so he videos. taught you how to edit then oh yeah yeah every every step of the way really yep mm. yeah that's crazy but yeah that, so that's how i got involved <clears throat> and then kind of just came back with the gopro thing yeah um but yeah that's crazy, crazy. So, I mean, your stuff, like we were tell- saying earlier, your stuff has evolved, your videos and stuff that you've done. It started out initially as entertainment. Yeah. I mean, I, I, let's... It'd be like the B-roll. And yeah. Like <clears throat> me telling the story and the vlog. Right. And now right. it's like... Now it's purely educational in, very my, much. in my idea. I mean, and you're, like, you're so good at being able to relay information to people in a short period of time and like it's very compartmentalized like it's very understandable it's not like there's not a lot of gray there's no fluff it's like yeah it's like i sat down with an outline and i'm like okay these are the key points of this technique and i need to teach them right and it is really very much so like educational like i'm going to teach you about a technique or a situation and i still enjoy making that excite like the entertainment pieces yeah but it's it's a totally different like you have to be in a different mind space sure um thad your son is like yep. very much good at doing the like b-roll and the filming yeah. and like the entertainment pieces and i right. just don't have like i, I don't have the, the focus the eye or well, maybe yeah, not the yeah, eye no, for it but the eye the focus yeah. like you look at these guys that are really 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 good the brian evies the thads yeah. the, the guys that are really good in the video realm i don't have like the focus or desire right. to do that anymore right. it's very much like I'm going to teach you how to fish and I'm going to teach yeah. you how to catch them the way that I know how to catch them. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. And, and like I said, you do a great job at it. And I mean, for anybody that, <laughs> that wants to get in and learn, like you've got hundreds oh, yeah. of videos from, you know, this technique and, and these, you know, how to tie this knot, how to, you know, just tons and tons seasonal. of stuff. Like it's yeah, just seasonal like, stuff. And it's, it's so purely educational and it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. But it's, no, it's super cool. It's very, um, yeah. I can remember when that shift happened and I was like, I enjoy just going out and filming and fishing, but like, right. I'm not creating entertaining enough content anymore sure. because like, that's not my personal focus. Right, right. So I remember when that shift happened, and I'm like, I want to hammer on these fish, right. and I'm going to tell you how to do it. Right, yeah. Versus like... No, that makes sense. Yeah. In my opinion, in 
I don't know if anybody else. I mean, there's a lot of people that are, are doing what you're doing, but I think you ta- you've taken it to another level. If you want to be a bass fisherman and you want to focus on bass fishing, you have basically wrote the encyclopedia A to Z on every technique, every bait, every lure, every gear setup, all the things that that people need to know to be successful at it. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, like, and they for really, me, it really truly is believe like, that. Especially for northern anglers, like my focus yeah. is really northern anglers. Yeah, yeah, it is regional. I it's, mean, because stuff that regional. works great up here may not work down south. And I mean, I think that's that's been proven, and yeah, vice versa. Like sure. some of the guys that we know, Alex Rudd and 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 Caleb, those guys have come up here and like, oh yeah, I'm gonna hammer them on this stuff because that's what's working down south <laughs> in Tennessee. <laughs> but they come up here to the northern area, and it's like, oh damn, like that technique doesn't work up here. Yeah, and it's been fun, man. Yeah. It's been a learning curve on how, how to go from, because if you watch my early tip videos, mm-hmm. it was like in the evening after I got done with a fishing trip, I, I like sit down and talk yeah. about it really quick. It's been a fun progression learning how to go from entertainment to learn right. how to really break it down in a presentation format right. and teach it. But yeah. no, it's been a lot, no. it's been a lot of uh, fun years That's on cool. What, uh, um, how many subs do you got now? Like 33,000, 33, yep. which is, that's very respectable. Yeah. I think I got like 700 on mine, but that's another different story. I'm not entertaining enough either, <laughs> I guess. So. <laughs> it's, there, it's, I'm always curious about this and I've tried to poll like my audience, like what do they like to watch? But yeah. when you start to poll your audience, you get like, for me, when I try to poll my audience, I'm like, I like to watch tip videos and like learn how to catch fish. Yeah. You don't get a very good like subsection of YouTube. Yeah. But I find it very interesting. Like, what is the cap on right. enter- on uh, informational content? Yeah. Like, what do I? What do you have to do to expand out of that? Yeah, it's really YouTube is so weird. And I mean, I'm I'm too old to try and figure it out. My goal is to just share information that I know, and you know, bring people like you on to share the information that you know. And just get it out there, and you know, and maybe there's, a, you know, hopefully there's an entertainment value to it as well as an educational value. You know, at least, you know, I can guide somebody to somebody else. You know, like you. Well, like when I was, I I did a little bit of a podcast for a while. Mm-hmm. For me, it's about like telling people's story, yeah. and I think that's what I enjoy about this podcast yeah. is you just get to talk to people and yeah. like tell people's story and like really invest in what people are talking about yeah, yeah as opposed to like day to mind people there's other podcasts out there that are like hey tell us about this technique right it's very loose it's very much like tell me your story yeah. like how'd you get to where you are right and i think there's a ton of value in that because we all want to know the backstory to how people got somewhere yeah you know because like you said everybody's got a story like with you you had no idea you didn't have a mentor you didn't have this so i like for you to be able to come on here and say okay I'm Ben Noak. Here's my story. Here's how I got to where I am. <laughs> it's so relatable too yeah. for so many people because it's hard to relay this story to people. Right. Right. Like, I can't sit down in front of a camera and be like, "Let me tell you about," yeah. you know, "Let yeah. me tell you about my story." No. Yeah. Because what's relatable is you started out in a little sixteen foot aluminum boat. <laughs> yeah. Well, guess what? There's millions of other fishermen out there that are living in and fishing out of that little 16 foot aluminum boat right now. And, you know, for you to come on here and say, well, yeah, when I was 14 years old, I started fishing out of my dad's hundred thousand dollar, you know, bass, bass boat. Like to me, it's very unrelatable. Well, this world <laughs> is, and it's so funny to me, this, this industry has changed so quickly Yeah, with the growth of tournament fishing, college mm-hmm. fishing in particular. Yeah. Um, when I was in college fishing, like guys were running what they could get their hands on. Sure. Like you have a speedboat, you take a cooler and you put an aerator in it. Yeah. You have a 14 foot tin can, you put a cooler in it with an aerator. Right. You have a boat that blows your, now you have to have a 40,000, $30,000 bass boat to compete. Yeah. It's crazy. Like FLW yeah. at the time, they would give you money. They give you a, an allowance. Mm-hmm. You were, there were 40 teams allowed to compete. Okay, if if you limited a field at forty teams, that thing would fill up in like five minutes. Plus, they give you an allowance now. Yeah. Um, and you didn't have to drag a boat. 
it was right after all of the Everstart tournaments. So what yeah. you'd do is you'd show up, you'd hop in the boat with one of the guys that didn't make day three, and they'd take you fishing. Yeah. It was it was wild. Totally different world. Yeah. I know this is probably wasn't in the notes that I, uh, that I showed you. So I guess explain to me and the people that are listening how the levels to get to into like say uh you know a bassmaster tour oh, yeah. how does that work so realistically um so for most people how it starts is you start at a local club level which okay. for me was the Sanford Lake Bass Club okay and then you kind of just get your roots there you learn how to fish right then you would go up to you find when regional. those local tournaments you find that okay i'm good enough to win the locals yeah like i'm know. good enough to win the thursday nighters and right. the saturday morning tournaments right. and i'm good enough to compete on my home lakes right. like the lakes within an hour and a sure. half around me. sure well then you start to fish a regional level so you go fish top bass or you go fish the michigan state tournament okay or you go fish whatever throughout the state of Michigan mm -hmm. or throughout the surrounding states. Right. Then you go to a regional level, which would be your Bassmaster Opens. I guess the second level would be like your BFLs, right? Okay. You go fish your BFLs, which is um, through MLF, Major League Fishing, okay. which is one of the tournament organizations. Um, the BFLs are like the regional circuits. Every state has okay. groups of tournaments called a, a and BFL. You can sh for people that get into those – what are the requirements? There's no requirements. There's no requirement. Yeah, there's you can no show up in a 14-foot rowboat, essentially. Uh, or yeah, do you have there's to, like there's... certain specifications on how big your okay. boat has to okay. be and what the, what the regulations and, yeah, are. Sure. And, um, but yeah, there's no qualification process. Okay. This is where bass fishing gets really weird because, like I mentioned, my first ever time in a bass boat, uh -huh. I was fishing as a co-angler in a semi-professional event. Sure. So the Toyota series, which yep. is now like the league right below professional, like you qualify through the Toyota series to qualify to be on the MLF tour. Okay. Well, I had signed up online and was a co-angler. So I was fishing as, um, you basically ride with a guy who owns a boat. Sure. And they take you to their spots and they, they're trying to compete on a boater side. Okay. And you're competing against other guys. That so are those guys are competing to get to the, uh, to qualify to fish in like a, an MLF yeah. or a BASS or whatever yeah. to like, level yeah and i'm just yeah. fishing out of the back of the boat. yeah i do nothing <laughs> it's so crazy because you like you like you jumped you like skipped the line so to speak yeah i didn't know <laughs> i didn't know the process nobody told you well, that's not really how you should no, start <laughs> no i showed up i made i had a 16th ounce drop shot so like there's a technique called drop shotting yep. which is a weight below your hook yeah for smallmouth fishing it's one of the most prominent techniques sure. especially during the summertime well right. On Lake Champlain, a lot of times in the summer, those guys smallmouth fish with yeah. a drop shot in like 25 foot of water. Right. I might have had a 16th ounce drop shot weight, yeah. which is so, so, so light. Like yeah. if you're fishing in anything more than 10 foot of water, like you got to have a quarter to three eighths right. to half ounce. Right. So your stuff is just like slow. But dude, I didn't down. catch them. Yeah. I got beat. Yeah. My eyes beat in. And I'm like, well, I might have gotten a little bit ahead of myself here. I don't know shit about this. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to this tournament, and I'm like, I'm going to win $10,000. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go win ten grand. But you don't know, Confidence, right? Confidence, man. Confidence um, is key. <laughs> so, yeah. You have your BFLs, which is regional level, or state level. Then you have your Toyota Series. Okay. Semi-professionals, which is regional level. Okay. Um, or you have your Bassmaster Opens. And then you qualify to fish the BASS elites okay, or the major league fishing bass pro tour or the invitation. And those are the big ones. Those are the big dogs. Those are the tele TV. Dollar. Yeah. Those are the TV. They're on TV. Yep. All the stuff you see on like the outdoor channel. But what's and stuff crazy like about that. bass fishing, man, there's no path. Like there's yeah. no path that says you have to follow X, Y, Z path. Okay. If a newbie wanted to go and had the money to sign up to go fish, all of the regional level events, the Toyota Series, the Bassmaster Opens, you could do it. Really? Oh, yeah. You have no, no qualifications. You just got to have funds. <laughs> FLW Tour, which is used to be the top tier of bass fishing, one of the top tiers. Yep. If you owned a Ranger boat, you could get priority entry into the FLW Tour. Because Ranger was a sponsor yeah. of that tour, and that's, like, that's what you had to yeah, have, you could, right? Uh, you could run other boats, but you'd be like, all the ranger owners get priority over you. Okay. okay. So like to enter the <laughs> tournaments. So there's a guy, I'm not going to name names, but there was a guy who bought a ranger boat. Yeah. Literally had never bass fished. 
like where Shea Baker works with him. Yeah. Had never bass fished, but he had a ranger, wanted to be a professional tournament angler, so he paid the entry fees. How and, much was an entry fee? Uh, at the time. Eight thousand dollars? Wow. For one tournament. Wow. So fifty thousand dollars for the year? <laughs> yeah. And a hundred thousand dollar bass boat. Right. That's a and that's big. practice and I mean he probably had two hundred thousand dollars in. I mean, yeah. it's it's sickening. He had a lot of money to begin with. I'm yeah. I'm, a, I'm sure you can't just or go do that. Cards, yeah, right? yeah, like, exactly. It's crazy. There's no path, so no one tells you like this is what you have to do. You don't have to qualify to fish semi professionally. Like that's wild. The only thing you have to qualify for now is the professional series: your Bassmaster Elites or your mm-hmm. MLF BPT. Hmm. It's crazy to me. That is insane, man. That is insane. So, um. Did you ever think when you got started in this that this is where you no. would be? No. Because you got some big stuff. I mean, One of there's my, some stuff uh, going on right now in your life. It's pretty exciting, to be honest with you. Crazy things. Yeah. I've helped design rods for Temple Fork, Yeah, which was a company that I worked with when I was in college. Yeah. Like, I met them at the national championship. They yeah. gave me a 50% off discount code, which was a big deal at the time. Yeah. I bought some TFO rods like 12 years ago. Right. Now I'm designing rod blanks and models for them. That's insane, dude. Um, like, and that's not just it's not just Temple Fork. I mean, yeah, you've done a have, lot of stuff. Yeah, the stuff you got sitting in front of you. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> people are coming to you for tips and information, man. Like, one of my very first YouTube video and and I guess series, quote unquote, was yeah. a series called Open Up. Okay. Because I wanted to fish the Elite Series. Yep. Out of college. Okay. So I bought a Phoenix boat, and yeah. I was gonna go fish the Bass. Mortgage Bastille. your life. Yeah, well, I, I had guess, no, I had no, well, I had no, uh, ex- I had no debt coming out of college. Right. I didn't have student loans. I was still living right. at home. Right. So what makes most sense? Let's go buy a fifty thousand dollar bass boat. Right. Right. At like, the time, they were only fifty thousand. They were only fifty grand. Right. <laughs> the next year, they jumped up in price and so on and so forth. Now bass boats are rid- yeah. incredibly ridiculous yeah. house prices. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was a lot of money. Yeah. But I wanted to fish Bassmaster Opens and fish the Bassmaster Elite Series the right. top. Be a professional fisherman. Sure. I never thought this camera would take me to have major sponsors give me yeah. opportunities to create tackle. Right. Like, we didn't have the audience I have on YouTube and social media. No. This wouldn't be possible. Those rods wouldn't be possible, regardless of how good you are. Nobody would know who Ben Nowak is. No. Nobody. A, no, I mean, nobody no, other than the nobody. local people within your little circle. Yeah, You right. know? Nobody wouldn't have known. Yeah. Yeah, right, like, and and that's really the incredible thing. Like, like I have this love hate relationship with social media because it is used for such crap. And, yes. and, and I mean, yeah. We'll but then, it. but then there's stuff that is so good about it that can boost Why? people to levels that they never thought was possible, or be able to contact and get and talk to people that you never ever would have been able to even sniff getting close to yeah that's a great thing about it it's crazy to me uh, yeah i'm not joking when i say all of my current friends i've made through social media in form one form or fashion it's crazy alex rudd yeah commented on a youtube video back in the day yeah like we had message back and forth he's one of my best friends yeah dardowski nathan dardowski yeah. i met him at a boat ramp two years later he found me on YouTube and was like, hey, did you happen did, to be at yeah. Wixom Lake <laughs> yeah. this day? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that was you and, like, yeah. this. And you. Yeah. Like, would have never happened without social media. Ron no. Kramer. Yeah. And then what's even wilder. Okay, so going back to your point about um, being able to reach out to people you'd never think to reach out. Yeah. I remember I was sitting in my office at work. I got a text message one day. Hi, Ben. This is Mark Zona. And I'm like, yeah, right. It's not Mark Zona. Like... It's like, crazy. Hi, Ben. I'm not sure if you heard of me. My name is Mark Zona. Uh, we're, you know, looking to film a show on, you know, wherever. Um, would love to pick your brain on a couple things. Like, I thought it was a joke. Somebody was punking you. Yeah, I'm like, well, this is not Mark Zona. Mark Zona is the biggest, like, arguably the biggest name in what is the sport of bass fishing yeah, currently. Yeah, in, 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 like, the... He's a TV personality. He's a personality. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, like... He's like a, well, I mean, he, Kevin Van Dam, who is essentially like Michigan's, I mean, the greatest bass fisherman to ever come out of Michigan and, yeah. and likely in the 
country or world, yeah. you know, but he's a Michigan native. Mark Zona is kind of like that same level. Yeah. He was a fisherman for a long time, correct? Yeah, or was he, he, he was, yeah, he could arguably be competing in the Elite Series. Right. Right, but he went to but he went series. but he went to the like the media side of it, and yep. now was like a, a commentator and stuff like yeah. mega, like huge. The dude's guy. a household name in the world of bass fishing. All through social media, man. Yeah, like all through social media. That's but insane. Like to your point too, I could reach out to anyone on social media and have a likely shot of getting a response yeah. from someone, which yeah. is crazy to me. It, this world didn't exist. No, like in college. This didn't exist for me. Right. In 2013, there was no such thing as a YouTuber. Yeah. There was no such thing as a vlogger. Like, it didn't happen. Podcasts weren't really... I don't think podcasts were really a thing until, like, 20... Maybe 2013, 14. Yeah. And they really didn't become a thing for the past, like, Nobody five years. Nobody knew what they were. Yeah, and no there's still a lot of people that don't know what a podcast... Most people my age, yeah. like my friends, they don't know what a podcast is. And it's <laughs> like, okay... And they're all like, well... YouTube, right? And I'm like, no, that's not what it is. Well, can I watch it on YouTube? Because I don't, this Spotify, this Apple podcast, I don't know what that is. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, well, let me help you. <laughs> Social media is the greatest thing at connecting people, but it's also like crazy. Yeah. There's what a lot of world. use for a lot of ugliness too. Yeah. So, yeah, that's crazy. So, I mean, you are now married, been yeah. married for how yep. long now? Since 2018. So, okay. So, five, five years. years. Five years now. Yeah, this now. is going to be year yep. five. Yep. Got a couple young kids, a couple young daughters. Yep. So, how has how has things changed? Incredibly. Man, yeah. I used to be a nomad. Yeah. So, like, Kylie used to work nights. Yeah. And so, I would get out of work at 5 p.m., Yep. hook the boat up, go fishing. I was fishing four or five days a week, plus yeah. days a week. And you were doing all of this in a full-time job at the time, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. When you first initially started, you were started the YouTube. You were... You had a job, yeah. a real job, not just like a part-time. Like, it was a real job. It was a real job, like yeah. working 40-plus hours a week in an office yeah. setting. So, I mean, it wasn't manual labor, but I get out at 5, 5.30, yeah. hook the boat up, go to the lake, fish till 10.30. Right. I remember coming home, unloading the footage. I'd wake up like two hours early and start to edit the footage, mm -hmm. get the video out at the end of the day. Yeah. And then I'd go fish again. And I was doing this on repeat. There were nights where Kylie would come and she'd stay with me at my house. Yeah. And I would edit in bed. And she's like, you got to go somewhere else. You can't edit in here yeah. anymore. <laughs> but that was like the first year to two years of YouTube, right? Like, yeah. I was super determined that yeah. it was going to be like. Consumed by it. Oh, dude. Yeah. Different level consumed. Yeah. And I was fishing so, so, so much. Never been more dialed into fishing yeah. in my life. Um. Now I'm a very different point in my life, <laughs> right? Like I'm fishing two to three, I would say maybe three days a month, maybe. Yeah. Like when I can get out. Right. Um, the con That's kind of what's forced the content to be more tip and informational driven. Yeah. yeah. Uh, including the fact that I just, that's kind of what I enjoy. I want to teach people. Sure. Um, but like it's a very different path. Yeah. I just sold my Phoenix. Yeah. That, yeah. So yeah, you started out with a... 16 foot aluminum boat, and then you went to yep. a, a, a fiberglass. 1994, 94, fiberglass yeah, Procraft. Yep. And then you took the big leap, yep. bought the bought the Phoenix. Because I was determined, man. Like, yep. you need a, a big boat to fish professionally. Like, if I'm going to travel and, and be the best on the bay, yeah. that was my goal. I wanted to be the best Great Lakes bass fisherman there was, yeah. which for a little while there, I would argue that I was one you of the right best. You were right up there, man. Like, you were really good. Like it People was, were getting pissed at you because yeah, people were mad you were, and people were showing too much according to them. Yeah. Yeah. And people yeah. were contacting me from across the country, like, to talk to me about what I'm doing on the Great Lakes. Yeah. My priorities totally changed, right? Like, I yeah. got married. Yeah. Um, I, I got more involved with the social media where I started to realize, like, I don't have to go out and be the very best on the bay. Like, right. I can go and catch two pounders or three right. pounders inland. But if I can translate that into information for people right. like so now basically my thought on selling the boat was one i don't want to have a boat payment like right the boat payment sucks oh yeah terrible the worst <laughs> especially when you're not using it right right and two i'm in i just bought a 1992 um champion bass boat yeah so it's an 18 foot boat 18 and a half foot boat what's crazy about this boat and I knew I wanted a champion because that was like when I was buying the Phoenix, I had also had my eye on a couple champions, like older champions, yeah. but it's hard to get a used boat loan. Right. Um, 
So they were like thirty grand back then. Right. I paid five thousand dollars for a nineteen ninety two champion. The boat, the deck on this eighteen footer is as long, if not longer, than my Phoenix. There's like a small console, like you're right. cramped in there. Right. There's hardly any back deck, but it's a boat that I can make my own. Right. And like I've had it on the bay twice, three okay. times already. Okay. It crushes waves. Really? Like I'm stoked. I'm super stoked on this boat, but priorities change, right? It's perfect for what I want to do. Yeah. I'm going to make it my own uh, EVA foam, Murray Matt. Yep. Um, is the flooring like I had to build compartments? It's yeah, a totally it's, different realm. So like, dude, that's insane that you <laughs> that that <laughs> that path. Like you went essentially the Phoenix. In my opinion, is, is one of the best boats ever in in yeah. the bass fishing industry, or really just in the boat industry. Yeah. You know, and then <laughs> you had that boat. You had <laughs> it. Like you had it. You had all the electronics, which I want to talk about that as well. Yeah. You had all of like ridiculous electronics like Deck you had out. tvs yeah. essentially at the steering wheel <laughs> at the front of the boat yeah and then you just said you know what my life priorities have changed yeah i'm going to go backwards essentially and get the boat that i wanted when i was young well i knew the priority for me was i still had to have something that i could fish out of right i looked at seriously looked at um like 14 foot john boats like yeah small tin can john boats yeah. that had toppers top floors on them yeah. like a bass boat with yep. a trolling motor yeah. seriously looked at it considered it they wanted like twenty five hundred dollars right. for these john boats and i came across this feet or this champion mm-hmm. and they wanted i think seven thousand yeah. dollars i went to look at this <laughs> i went to look at this champion and this guy rolls in with this boat it's the bottom was like covered in barnacles it, it sat in the water. It a sat in long the water before time. him, right? So yeah. be, the owner before him had it sat in the water. He had it sitting out on the edge of a cornfield. So it had like, <laughs> it had overspray from road paint all over the motor, all over the side of the boat. Um, I'm like, dude, I'm not paying you seven. Uh, I'm not paying you seven grand for this thing. I opened up one of the live wells, and where the water flows in, there were little tiny dead mice in there. Oh my god. So I offered him five grand yep. because the hull and the motor, if I could get it cleaned up, was worth yeah. that. Yeah. Dude, the first like three weeks with this boat were crazy. Yeah. Um, the bones were good. Yeah. The bones on the boat were fine. Yeah. Had two decent Lawrence graphs. Okay. And I knew there were things I wanted to change about it. Right. And so I've been really putting in a ton of time. It's a different boat now. Yeah. It's like taking a retro car, you know, like an old car and like bringing it into the modern, you know, the modern age and stuff, which is like, it's super cool because you could have easily like doubled down and said, oh, I'm getting a brand new Phoenix. I could have is- reached out like, and I'm not saying this is a flex, but like I could reach out to Montcalm Marine yep. or like some of these marinas and be like, Hey, do you have a pro deal where I can get on? you know, at a discounted yeah. price or get a 360 deal where you get a boat for 360 days with the right. um, expectation that you're able to sell it for full price sure. or you have to pay the difference. Right. Like you can probably do that. It's not that difficult. Right. But I knew like that wasn't my goal. Yeah. Like yeah. I wanted a boat. I could seriously, dude, I had to build, I'll show you pictures. I had to build the boat deck. Yeah. So like these old boats only had half of a boat deck. Okay. Then had like seats on the side. Well, I had to take plywood Take treated um, two by fours, yep. build frame, yep. build compartment lids, yep. like ripped out all the carpet, sand out in the flooring. See, I just, I think that's so cool that that's just a proving that like you do not need no, dude. the biggest, baddest, best, most expensive rig out there to go you know, fish these tournaments or whatever. And I know a lot of people Some don't of it, do that, but people think like, oh gosh, you got to have that, you know. When I was selling the boat, that was kind of what turned me that way. Because yeah. there was part there was part of me that was like, well, I'll sell the Phoenix and get something pretty nice. Yeah. But I'd like spend $30,000 and yeah. go get something very well decked out already. Yeah. Pretty nice newer. And then I started talking and looking at what Nathan's, my buddy Nathan Dorosky yeah. is doing. Fishing out of like a 1984 Ranger 362, yep. like whatever. And I'm like, you know, I can still catch them. I can still high hammer. Because I was looking at a $20,000 champion. Yeah. Like a, ni- or a 2001 champion. Yeah. Really, really nice. 
I'm like, do I want to spend 20 grand when I can spend five grand? Yeah. I'll probably, when it's all said and done, I think I'm going to have $9,000 into this boat. Yeah. It's just fishing. Dude, it's, <laughs> it's just fishing, right? I'm going to have nine grand paid off. I already replaced the trolling motor. Yeah. It's got a Garmin Force okay. trolling motor. Um, I have a Garmin graph on it. Yep. Like my, we can get into the electronics. Yep. My style of fishing very much is electronics driven. Yep. Like that's something I really, really enjoy, yep. which is co- totally opposite of how I got mm-hmm. into the sport, which was very much feel like you better go be able to find cover that you can flip and fish shallow. Yep. Um, but I love looking at the the graph and finding right. fish deep and suspended and catching them finesse. Yeah. And so I have live scope on yeah, it. And essentially I have you can do that in any boat. You can do it in anything. Yeah. You could have done it. I was going to do it in a John boat. Yeah. I was, cause a lot of what I enjoy, like the bay is cool, but what was cool about the bay is no one was doing it. Right. Right. Like you and I have talked a lot yeah. about this. What makes the bay so cool is you're fishing untouched water. Right. None of it's untouched anymore. No, no, it is definitely not untouched. <laughs> now it's like, what I love is going and fishing those small inland lakes and really like, um, I don't want to say exploiting, but really figuring out what's in there. Yeah. Like there's some of those inland lakes where we're catching close to 30 pound bags of smallmouth that are small. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. And I just love, like that's my passion now is going into exploring these smaller bodies of water and and i knew that i could do it with the phoenix or yeah. uh, a 92 uh, champion yeah i didn't yeah. need the phoenix <clears throat> it's kind of funny thad when we met yeah he went in your phoenix and he's like dad that i gotta have a boat like this i gotta <laughs> have a boat like this well he ended up finding that skeeter which was an old skeeter 90 i can't even remember it was, it was old beautiful but boat. it was a absolutely Pristine. beautiful bass boat and he had it, and I mean, he rigged it out. Yeah. He had Garmin up front, you know. Uh, Altrex. Tr- uh, yeah, yeah. Altrex trolling motor. I mean, it was pristine. After about th- man, two, three years of that, he just decided, you know what? I don't, I don't think I need this. You know, and granted, he was young. Like, he bought this thing, I think, when he was 18. So he was super young when he bought it. And he realized that, he could still fish everything that he wanted to fish. Yeah. You know, g- granted, you could go out to the bay, but it's got to be on a, a good weather day. Yeah. But that's with any boat, you know, that he could he could still do all the things that he has done in this really nice bass boat in just a regular John boat. And that's exactly what he did. He And there's the, part of it, and, yeah. and you can probably attest to this, like when you're fishing out of these nice boats, like it's just, it's a vessel, right? Like yeah. it, it really, and that's not like punny. It really is just the vessel to get you there. Yeah. But when you know you're having to make a boat payment or you yeah. know you're having to like, I don't know, there's part of going back to like your roots of like oh, uh, yeah. having the nicest boat. Right. Right. And right. like, that's really refreshing to just yeah. like get out and go and like not have to think about the craziness of. Right. I don't know. Yeah, it was weird. So, yeah, he sold that. He sold that boat, bought the current boat he's got, which is a tiller, 16-footer. Essentially, it's a a John boat. Yeah. We went up north a couple weeks ago and took the boat and went fishing. And I just from what you had taught us and, and, you know, the things that I just kind of knew, we went and just started fishing this lake. No electronics, just cruising. And I knew what I was like wanted to look for yeah because the water was super clear like we caught a bunch of smallmouth and i was just like <laughs> we just freaking did this yeah out of this rickety ass little 16 footer so i mean it's like <laughs> yes. it can be done people it, it absolutely can be done you do not have to have the best of the best but and it's just about what you really enjoy right like there's yeah. something really enjoyable about that yeah like doing that yeah right like for me it's really enjoyable I just like catching them, right? Yeah. Like the champion's just able to get me out there to it's catch them. It's a tool, them. man. At like, the end of the day, these but are I all don't, just tools. Yeah, but I don't need, like, I, it, it really comes down to what you want and what you need, but right. there's a lot of part of me that really is excited about having an older boat. Oh, yeah. I can just go hammer on fish yeah. with. Yeah. And I don't have to think about nobody's, all the extra crazy. It's funny because nobody's going to look at you and go, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. Because, you know, you had the Phoenix. It's like, oh, shit, this guy's, like, serious. Like, That's this right. guy knows That's what right. he's doing. Like, we should probably, like, just follow. But it's Watch. happening in the local tournament scene, too, where, yeah. like, 
you're seeing guys get into the sport, right? And it's very funny. You look at the best of the best right now at the mm-hmm. local scene. You have Billy Booth. Yeah. You have Steve Glenn, Andy yep. Meyer. You have um, John Franco and Durds, yep. right? And a couple yep. other guys. They're all running old boats. Yeah. They're running boats that are beat up yeah. and they're fished out of. They're just good fishermen. But you look though. at the new guys that are coming in and yeah. it's brand new boats. Brand new and stuff. And they're pristine yeah. and they're super nice. Yeah. But like they're not fished they're out. They're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. If that makes any sense. No, it does. Like it's not the boat that's catching in the no, fish. 100%. And, and I think there's a lot of guys, especially at the college, and I'm, <sighs> he'll never listen to this. There's a kid that I sold my boat to and I was a little bit turned away by this. He looks at my boat which is one of the best boats ever on the market. Mm-hmm. A Phoenix 920 Pro XP. Yep. Big water boat. Phenomenal. He was like, yeah, I think this is going to be a great starter boat for a college kid. <laughs> and I'm like... Choke. <laughs> uh, if I didn't, like... I don't, yeah. I wouldn't... <laughs> I didn't the, even know what to say. The expectation has changed. It's changed drastically. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. But, like, we can start to talk about the electronics yes. piece. Yes, because... Yes, let's get on that because that is a huge thing. That is huge yeah. because when I grew up, no, there was no electronics. There was none right. of those things just in the last, say, five years. Yeah. Yeah, that's since 2015. Yeah. So it was the very first forward yeah. forward Yeah, so facing eight cylinder. years then. Yeah. Side imaging came out in 2009. Yep. Um, relatively unusable, but it came out from Humminbird, which essentially side imaging, what it does, it shoots below your boat and out to the side of your okay. boat. So it takes a picture image essentially yep. of what's on the bottom out to the side of your boat. Yep. Well, it revolutionized bass fishing because you can now not only see on sonar, which is 2d sonar <laughs> is basically large blob images. Mm-hmm. Imagine like pictograms where people tell you like, what do you see? Yeah. Right. Like to uh, the side imaging and down imaging technology is, is a true image of what is on the bottom right. to the side of your boat and below your boat. Yeah. Revolutionized bass fishing. Yeah. Then in 2015, Garmin came out with a technology called um, Panoptics. Yep. I was literally one of the first people in the country to have Panoptics. Like, I was waiting on my Panoptics unit to get off the boat from China and working in supply chain. Like, Mm -hmm. in 2015, there was an issue where none of these ships from China could get into the port of Los Angeles. Well, my Garmin was sitting on a ship stuck off the port of Los Angeles. Hmm. So I was, like, waiting on it to come in, put it on my boat. And that's when I really started exploring and, and becoming yeah. good on the Great Lakes. Right. Um, in this technology, Panoptics wasn't very popular until they came out with what's called now called Live Scope. Yeah. Essentially, live picture imaging. Yeah, it's insane. In front of your boat. Like, I yeah. can shoot it out while I'm fishing. Live imaging of fish, like swimming in the water column yep. and my bait coming through the water. Um, I essentially call it video game fishing. It's video game fishing. For sure, it's video game fishing. Yeah, because it's so clear, it's so crisp, it's so accurate. Yeah. Like, you can see a fish. Yeah. You can identify. I'm now you at can a point where I can identify what, what kind fish of fish it is. is. Yeah. Right. Like, and it takes a lot of time of looking at the screen and figuring out right. what it is. But once you're good, you can identify. Okay, that's a bass. Yeah. Oh, that's a walleye. Yeah. I can tell by the way it's swimming. That's yeah. not a bass. I can see rock structures. I can see shadows. Yeah. I can see everything it it's it yeah i don't know i don't know if it's cheating uh there's part of me that's like it it's not really fishing it's yeah. going around until you see them on your graph and learn how to catch them like figure right. out how to trick them into biting right because like when you got that and we were going fishing together i'm looking at that we, graph. you never <laughs> you never picked your head up to look no. anywhere you essentially were casting with your head down because you knew, okay, that fish is 30 feet out there. I knew. He's seven <laughs> feet down. So you, we would be standing behind you, and you'd be like, okay, just cast over here 20 feet, you know, or 30 feet, whatever. And it, it, it yeah. was so weird. It it's, was so it's not, weird. It's not really fishing. But so um, it got to the point I could tell, like, okay, where is my foot positioned on the trolling motor? I know that means the trolling motor is pointed to the right. Yeah. I know that I can see if the patrol motor is pointed to the right, there's fish 30 foot out and I can just flip. I never have to look up. Yeah. And a lot of people. So what this has caused going back to like the new boat thing, Mm -hmm. everyone feels like they have to have forward facing sonar to compete. It's creating a problem in bass fishing where people don't know how to just fish. Yeah. 
people don't know how to locate bass. So like my foundation in bass fishing was locating bass by looking at my graph, by right. like looking at my physical map of yeah. the lake, the topography of the lake to yeah. locate where bass should live. Well, now that you add forward facing sonar into mm-hmm. that, I can now identify where bass are living and tell if they're on it much, much, much more quickly with the combination of the two. Right, right. But if you don't learn the basics. Yeah, see, and that's where you and I differ because that stuff was never existed when we were kids. They're even, you know, into my 20s and 30s, like it didn't exist. So, like, you just had to be a sound fisherman. You know, you just kind of had to know and keep that in your brain. Like, okay, I caught them here one time off this log or off this brush pile or off this ledge or whatever. Yeah. So those are the things that I had to keep in my mind. And then like the introduction to all this new electronics is like, Oh my God, this is like blowing me away. Even mapping, right? You start to look at mapping technology and like arguably with how good forward facing is mapping is even better. Like you can identify fish where fish are going to be even faster by looking at your mapping. I'm sure that's something that, because you have so much experience just saying, okay, you know, I caught them on a channel, like on a channel bend. Yeah. Then you look at your map and you're like, oh, well, here's a channel bend I didn't even know existed. Right. Like you can read that much more. It's, yeah. it's crazy. When you understand the fundamentals, yep. you can start to take these technologies yeah. and really apply them so much right. faster. Right, right. And I think because Thad's new boat, he doesn't have any electronics yeah. on it. But like I, I guess like just knowing what I learned – from the electronics and kind of knowing what I see. Cause I mean, I can, you know, you can look at your phone and pretty much see the, the <laughs> mapping of a lake anymore. I mean, it's pretty easy, but like just knowing that, like I can still be semi productive, you know, fishing, maybe not so much deep water fishing, but, yeah, but you like, know, sh- you know, edges and stuff like that. There, you can see it. Yeah. But there weren't, there weren't deep fishermen really. I mean, no. for for the most part, right? Like until 2013, there was a guy named Mark Rose who's a professional bass angler. Yep. He was dominant in deep water fishing. Yep. The second side imaging technology came out. Okay. And better mapping. So like the TVA lakes, Mark Rose was the guy in like 2013 to 2016. Dominant. Yep. But he understood mapping and he understood where fish lived. Um and so it's just very funny. Like these technologies change the way we, we are able to fish and yeah, catch them. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. So, um, are you still working with Garmin? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We yeah. just signed up uh, again for another year. And uh, they didn't come up with anything really new this year, but yeah. they have that live scope. Yeah. Technology. Where's the next? What, what, what's the next step? I think it. <laughs> so there's a technology from. A company called Humminbird okay. 360 yep. Imaging. Yep. Takes a 360 image around your boat. Okay. Um, I think that's going to be so. It's just kind of, it's like next. sonar. Your boat's the center of it, and it just spins around. It literally spins around in this cone and like, yeah. and draws a picture in a circle. It's side imaging yep. essentially that spins around. Spins in around in a circle, so you can yeah. see how far how far outside uh, of your boat. I think you can see like 200 feet. Wow. Yeah. So, you so can further see reef, than any cast. Yeah. You, you know. can see like reef edges. You can see. But it's not live, so that's the downfall of this technology. Okay. I think that's the next place you start to see sonar technologies mm-hmm. go. Um, I would expect to see some advancements in mapping. I think yeah. that's the next thing is, yeah. like, community mapping. So, like, when you're out graphing or you're out, I think I think companies are doing this without us even knowing, Yeah. especially when you hook your phone up to your graph. Like, I think they're technically getting mapping and not telling you they're doing it and sending it back to their feedback system. Really? I, I have to believe. I don't know how you get all these high definition maps of all these yeah. various bodies of water. You can't pay people enough. Right. Um, so I think mapping is next. And then I think the technology of like augmented reality where you put on a pair of glasses. Yeah. And like you Virtually can see the contours glasses. or yeah. like oh you gosh. can see your fish finder through your glasses. So you like look. I think that could be the next it's two. Insane. It's so hard to believe that this even would it's, even exist. But in I, this I'm day kind and of age, at a point yeah. where, like, I don't want it to get any easy. Like, this is, yeah. I'd be okay if it stayed right here. Right. Even right. with live scope, there's parts of me that are like, man, I would just like to go. F-. Like, there's times I'll turn it off and just fish. Wouldn't it be interesting to start seeing tournaments that go to, like, what 
old school tournament. Like no electronics, boys. We're I would love just if you could gonna just have a fish. Ma- I would love if you could have a map. And you could have just basic, like, a flasher 2D sonar that tells you the depth. Yeah. Just to keep you safe, right? Yeah. It would be interesting to see how many people would be successful in a tournament without... Changes. A lot of these young it. kids wouldn't make it. I probably... I would definitely not. I yeah. mean... I you think have a I little have bit of knowledge. Of, I have enough yeah. knowledge where I yeah. can be okay, but it changes everything, man. You'd be, like, blind. Yeah. <laughs> it was hard. When I got this boat and I was, like, fishing yeah. the first couple times, yeah. it was different because I'm like, oh... Crap, I don't have my eyes. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm going to go. I don't have my x-ray vision. I went out to Bud. <laughs> yeah. I went out to Bud Lake, which is moderately clear. Yeah. And uh, I was on the trolling motor just flipping grass edges. Mm-hmm. I ended up catching a few fish. But, yeah. like, that is how I used to fish. Yep. You know, I'm fishing the inside grass line. I'm fishing the edge. Like, yeah. I'm fishing docks. Like, right. It was cool. It was yeah. refreshing. There's no, parts was, of me that yeah, really Yeah, there's part missed. of that that's just like, man, this is this is fun. Yeah. This is fun. What's uh what's your favorite technique? Live scoping. <laughs> That's that L- young kid L- coming out in you. Looking hammer. at them swimming and catching. <laughs> no, um, whatever they want to bite, man. Like yeah. I'll drop shot for them if that means I'm going to catch them. Okay. I love to crank bait for them. I love to throw a jig. That's yeah. probably my my. If I could get a bite. And that's the only thing. I, if I can only use one yeah. technique, it's going to be a jig. Okay. So like a half ounce jig. With some sort of relative cross style trigger. Yeah. yeah. I love the bite. I love being able to set the hook hard. Okay. How about feel. how about uh, seasonals? You know what season? Yeah. Uh, in the spring, I l- in the spring my top technique is going to be a jerk bait or a small swim bait. Okay. In the summertime, I'm going to have a jig for large mouth. Okay. And I'm going to have a drop shot for small mouth. I'm probably okay. like you only need. Probably something, two rods you can get away with. Something. So in the springtime, they're more active? Yep. In the springtime, those fish are moving. They're feeding. The okay. water temps are what I believe, like optimal temperature. Right. They've been frozen all winter. Water temps are on the rise. These fish's metabolism so is feeding So something more up. reactionary. Reactionary yep. up in the water column. They're feeding, getting fat. Okay. Summertime, the water is really hot. So they're cold-blooded creatures. So their metabolism increases. So they'll eat. The problem is they're pressured now. Yep. They've seen baits. Yeah. So you almost have to slow down a little bit. Right. I like a jig because it's so visual and so yeah. much fun. You can flip it into heavy cover yep. or a drop shot. It's super slow, subtle. It's non-intrusive. Okay. And it just gets a lot of bites. During the fall, which I guess we're coming up to in a few months now, yeah. which is nuts. Yeah, we're a couple months away. It's a, um, yeah. Love fishing a crankbait. Yeah. Crankbait or jerk bait, And for large mouth. I'm so back to real reactionary bait because yep. they're... They're pushing shallow. They're more on the feed again, correct? Yep. I, be- yeah. I believe that it has a lot more to do with, like, optimal body temperature of a bass, not because they know winter's coming. Okay. Especially up here in the, in the north. Like, I don't believe it's because, you know, winter's imminent. Yeah. I think it's, like, that 60 to 45 degree range, yep. that's an optimal temperature for those fish to expend a lot of energy. Mm-hmm. And it congregates all the bait fish shallow. Do you think... Weather plays a lot in a bite. Mm-hmm. I think there's a, like if you had like what would be like your perfect scenario weather for largemouth prefrontal or during the middle of a front. So okay. like right before a hard rainstorm mm-hmm. or right during that rainstorm when there's changing conditions. Okay. For smallmouth, I think wind, sun, and if you can get a front. That's good too. Yeah. But those fish are super visual feeders. So you okay. want like moderate clarity. You want okay. good to normal clarity water. Um, and then wind helps you kind of disguise your boat. And sure. it also helps position fish. And then sun obviously helps them see. Okay. All right. See, to me, I would think that sun would be more like it's going to drive them, up, you know, down into a darker. And it will. You know, that's, yeah. a, that's the other benefit. So like the wind is going to help um, make those fish want to eat. Yep. The sun's gonna help drive them lower in the water column. So then you can kind of you can kind of, I guess, shrink down your area. Yeah, that to, wind's to gonna help position them too, right? So sure. like it's gonna create natural currents whether you're on yep. the Great Lakes or you're on a okay. kind of river system. So it will position them closer <clears throat> to the bottom. If it's very sunny and no wind, those smallmouth will lift off the bottom and get like the middle middle of the yep. water column and be able to swim anywhere yeah. they want. They're not positioned. They're very tough. Like you gotcha. and I have experienced where oh yeah we're out drop shotting. In the morning, it's low light conditions. Mm-hmm. The fish can't see very well. 
There's a little bit of wind. Typically, it's colder water. Those fish are pinned to the bottom. Yep. The sun gets high. Those fish seem to disappear. They yeah. get way up in the water column. Yeah. So if you had, if you had to have three setups for year round, yep. what would they be? I'd have a seven foot medium heavy bait cast rod. Okay. With like 15 pound test fluorocarbon line. Um, that's super versatile. You can throw literally just about any technique, three eighths ounce and heavier. Okay. I'd have a seven foot medium spinning rod. Again, super incredibly versatile. Mm-hmm. And then I'd have like those, if the, that'd be it. Yeah. Like I could do pretty much everything with a seven foot medium, a heavy bait caster and a seven foot medium spinning rod. So you don't need, well, why do guys have 20 damn rods on there? Uh, we got is it, in, is it is it just based off of like because they want to be able to change and not have yeah. to tie? Yeah, but like you'll see guys have different lengths, powers, actions of rods. Okay. Um, for a long time, I was very much like this, right? Yeah. I need a seven foot medium for throwing my Ned rig. I yeah. Need a seven one medium light for throwing my drop shot. Sure. I need a seven three for. Th- it's gotten to the point like, do you really? Or like, no. That seven one medium can do your Ned rig. Can do yep. your drop shot, can yeah. do your spy bait, can do your tube. So, like, I work with a company called Temple Fork, and yep. this is one of the problems we saw in the industry. You're having 20 skews, 20 to 25 rods, mm-hmm. to try and match every angler's thing. Now, they, they just came out with two different lineups. I believe the Taction series. Okay. Well, let me go back. They have a series called Resolve. Okay. It's the top line, but there's nine actions total. Total nine skews okay. between... I think three or four spinning rods. Yep. And five or six bait cast setups. Super, super basic. So seven foot cranking rod or jerk bait rod. Yeah. Seven three medium heavy. Seven five heavy. Like, and then I think they have a seven ten because you got to have it for like those deep swim bait sure. or deep crank bait, deep swim bait guys. But like, you're starting to see companies now get away from the technique specific. Yeah. Less skews. Saves them money, but also, like, as anglers, we don't need all of that. And I think the more advanced you get, you start to, like, step back. Be like... You figure out what you use more yeah. and what you don't use. Yeah, a lot of it's trial and error, too. Right? Yeah. Like, you have to go through and buy a bunch of rods to figure out what you like or what yeah. you don't like. But it, their new series, I think, have, like, 10 or 12 SKUs. So yeah, they, you got to still cater a little bit. But, like, for me as an angler, my most used rods... Seven one medium light, mm-hmm. seven six medium light. Or I would say seven one medium light and seven three medium. Yeah. Spinning rod. Yeah. Bait cast setup. Seven foot medium. Seven three medium heavy. Okay. I could have four rods and most of the times like I'll have the same rod, three different techniques. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. So it's it's weird you say that. My just I mean, I'm older. So when I see guys just have ridiculous amount of rods sitting on their deck, it it confuses me. I'm just like, what? Do you really need that many damn rods? I feel like you could do it with, like you said, two or three, maybe four. And I'm I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I, I just don't know enough about it to you know to to think. Oh, I got to have this and this and this and this. Like, you might see me. I might have eight rods. Yeah. I would argue I have three different setups. Gotcha. Right? So, like, I might have three of the same rods with different techniques. On okay. Them. It's just about ease to, like, I don't have to retie this drop shot. I and can I, just bend over and pick up a net. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's probably balls. a lot of it is just the convenience. And, you know, I mean, I guess if you're a tournament fisherman, I mean, time is money. Yeah. Yeah. You want to just be able to pick up that next rod and fling it out there, yep. you know, for that next fish. So I that was one of the things I could never – it just always kind of blew me away because being, like, I'm mainly a steelhead fisherman or trout fisherman. But if you show up with more than two rods, like, you're just wasting your time. You're wasting it. time, yeah. right? Like, I think uh, it's putting the industry in a weird spot where guys feel like they have to have so many different rods. Yeah. And you'll see, like, very top premier guys that are like, oh, I need this exact action mm-hmm. for this exact setup. Yeah. And this is the only bait I can throw on that. I'm not like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's all about convenience there, for me. Yeah. It, and, and I think that's why, you know, it, like you said, it's a lot of convenience part of it. So, yeah. um, you make your own baits. Yeah. You started up a bait making channel, YouTube channel, separate yep. from your, your other channel. Yeah. So, and I mean, it's mainly plastics. Uh, right? It's just all bait making. So like jigs, okay. lead jigs. Okay. So you're actually and, pouring uh, jigs. Yep. Okay. And then uh, soft plastics. Yeah. The benefit of being able to do both is like in one video, I can be like, hey, here's a swim bait. And this is the lead jig swim bait head yep. that I'm putting with the swim bait. Okay. So like I'll kind of combine the two into one video. Okay. Um, but for me, it came from I don't want to have to go spend. Okay. More money. Yeah, and that's what I was gonna say. It's ba- purely based off of just saving money. Saving money and really customizing. Yeah. So like I can make baits and put the hook in it that I want. Sure. Put the bait keeper that I want. Yep. Tie the skirt that I want. Yep. And it's not gonna cost me the, even a fraction of what it would right. cost me to go down to the tackle store and buy it. Right. Yeah. How much money do you think you can save by making it in comparison to if you bought the same amount of say jig heads um, from a you know at the store or manufacturer? The initial investment, so like a, a mold's fifty bucks mm-hmm. for a lead mold. Okay. Right. About fifty dollars. Yep. I bet on every jig you're saving a dollar. Okay. So the first fifty you're losing money. Sure. After that. You're making a dollar a jig. Yeah. I um, mean, at the end of the day. Well, and there's something to be said about catching a fish on a lure that you created. Yeah, and you can dial it in. Especially, yeah. like, my recommendation to anyone getting into it would be buy the things that you know you go mm-hmm. through a lot of or the things that you use quite a bit, yeah. right? So, like, drop shot sinkers. I, I haven't bought, okay, a drop shot sinker is Ned Riggs and a jig. Mm-hmm. Those are my top three molds for sure. Yep. Um, but I haven't bought a piece of lead tackle. I was thinking about this the other night when I was pouring swim yeah. heads. Years? Years. Years. Yeah. I mean, That's there's huge. so many good molds out there. Yeah. Um, there's so many great, great hooks you can customize, mm-hmm. and especially as you start to figure out what you like. It's incredible. Yeah, that's cool. And, and like I said, there, there is something. There is a really it's a cool, cool factor, feeling. Like, yeah, like it's man, like, I caught that fish on a bait that I tied or I poured. Yeah. Or, or like, plastic that I, <laughs> po- you know, molded this and that. Yeah. There's something cool about that for sure. I think it's my second or third mold I ever bought. It's the Sparky Weedless mold. Yeah. And I've been pouring jigs for a long time because yeah. Andy taught me how to fish a jig. Okay. Yeah. And I got tired of buying jigs. Yeah. I remember the first time I ever tied a jig, it was green pumpkin with a little bit of orange on the belly. Mm-hmm. And I caught big bass on uh, Smallwood Lake with Andy. Yeah. And then Andy had me tie him like three right. or four of those jigs. Right. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's cool. Just really cool. That's feeling. cool. So, all right. So now, yeah, on that's to what kind you of got, got in front of you. It's kind of gotten us to this point here. Okay. okay. So a lot of like this bait design came from my ability to understand how colors work in plastics. Plus, yeah. um, I drop shot a lot. Yeah. Like when I'm smallmouth fishing, I drop shot a lot. Right. And I have probably tried most of the drop shot baits that ever right. have come to market. Like I have boxes. I'm not kidding. Like boxes yeah. of different drop shot baits. Yeah. And you taught me how to do it. And I'm like, you, that really is like, that's it's such my a favorite great technique. technique. I it's love so doing it. It's so much fun. It, it gets yeah. bites. It's, it's contact. Like a lot of people hate drop shot fishing because yeah. it's like they fish it so slow. Well, it's boring. But you and I like, <laughs> My my approach to drop shot fishing is target fishing. So right. like I'm flipping it into a piece of grass. Yeah. I know there's a boulder there. I'm flipping yeah. the boulder fish a little bit. Like it's kind of boring, but gets bites it's and cool. impact fishing. It's cool. It's cool. So tell so, me, tell us about what you got going on here. Um, I had the opportunity in January. The guy from Excite, Lloyd Walker, okay. reached out and was like, "Hey, I'm looking to create a smallmouth lineup of baits. Would you want to design some?" a drop shot bait for me. Yeah. I knew Lloyd cause he was my very first sponsor ever in 2013. Okay. Um, my buddy Ryan Collins was like, Hey, you need to try this square belt crankbait catches yep. the crap out of fish. Yeah. So I reached out to Lloyd and was like, Hey, I'm going to try and fish the opens. I'm starting to make some YouTube videos. Do you want to mm-hmm. work with me? So in 2013 we worked together, but he's very much a Texas company. Okay. Craws. Yeah. Big worms. Right. You know, big jig heads. Yeah. No not, small mouth baits n- yeah. ever. Like there was not nothing northern. in the lineup. Not northern at all. They just came out with a fluke. Yeah. Which was like a small mouth E style bait. Sure. Sure. So he's like, hey, do you want to design a drop shot bait? So we got on the phone and I told Lloyd, 
My problem with the drop shot is I don't want to carry two boxes of lures because I need to imitate gobies and mm-hmm. I need to imitate bait fish. Right. And I'm like, I want a bait, and I have an idea in my mind of how I can design a bait that imitates gobies and bait fish all in one. Yeah. And I'm like, not just the profile, but like the color theory. So if you look at this bait, the goby profile is a flat bottom, rounded body, yep. comes to a tapered tail. Yep. All drop. Sh- oh, like that's what a goby looks like. Right. And most goby baits out there are designed that way. Yep. So this is your goby profile, right? Yep. Dark back, flat body. Yep. Well, when you start to think about bait fish, a bait fish typically has a flat back, rounded belly, tapered tail. Yeah. Right? Well, that's a bait fish profile when you flip it this way. Right. Flat back, rounded belly, tapered right. tail. Right? There's no company out there that has ever said, let me make a goby bait. That looks like a... That looks like a goby. Yeah. And a bait fish bait that you, all you have to do is turn it over. That's cool, man. And not only that, like, it has totally different action. So, like, when you start to look at the action of a bait, yeah. you have mo- arguably the most popular drop shot bait ever, the Berkeley um, flatworm. Flatworm. <laughs> right? Flat bottom, <laughs> rounded back. Yep. Doesn't really look like a bait fish. Kind of looks like a goby. Yeah. But what makes it great is the flat side will cause the bait to glide. Yep. So, a goby has a gliding action. Well, with a flat side on the bottom, yep. this bait actually, like on a net rig, will glide. Okay. And well, these fins... Will cause the bait to stabilize, so nice. it'll glide down. Yeah. When you flip the bait over and the fins are higher on the body, it's going to have a lot more body roll. Right. And the rounded belly is going to cause it to dart. Like an airplane. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But it's still going to stabilize. Right. It's crazy. Like, that was kind of intentional, but kind of unintentional design of this bait. When did you have this epiphany that this is what, I, this is what I'm looking for? I got tired of carrying so many plastics. Gotcha. And like I knew, like we'd go out to the bay. Yep. And we drop shot. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I know these are bait fish eaters. Yeah. So I grab the um, Beast Coast Magic Flick. Yep. Because it looks like a bait fish. Yep. Well, then we realized, hey, they're on gobies on bottoming right. in the other section of the bay. I'm going to the um, Bass Magnet Twitch. Yep. Very similar profile. Yep. Right. Well, I took all of my favorite designs and started to mash Just them up. Just looking at them. And, and I'm like, yeah. holy smokes. Why has no one ever thought, like, all you had to do was flip the bait over? Yeah. And why has no one ever thought, like, if you flip the bait over and give it two different profiles, now you're going to pour your pe- you're gonna pour your lures differently. Right. Your bait fish patterns have a dark back yep. on the flat side. Well, so this has a dark back right. on the flat side. Your goby Gobies. profiles have a dark back on the rounded portion. In a lighter section, like no one has, no, no one has done this. Zero companies have oh. said, "Let's do this." So when I had to explain it to Lloyd, and I sent him the drawing, he's like, "How is that going to look like a bait fish?" I'm like, "Lloyd, turn turn your phone upside down." Yeah. It's like, oh my god, it has a rounded belly, and a tapered tail. He's like, "How did you think of this?" And I'm like, "I don't know, man." It's like, we- it's weird because literally, it's like just. Flip it over on your hook. <laughs> like, turn it the other way. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, and so I started taking, like, my favorite things. The spark shad has little wings on it yeah. that helps stabilize the bait. So I added yeah. the wings to stabilize. Well, yeah. these wings cause different actions depending on how the bait's rigged yeah. because of where they're positioned on the bait. But they also cause the bait to catch water on the fall yeah. and spiral like a tube. Right. So, like, I also knew there's a bait called... Um, the Jekyll crosstail okay. shad was okay. a phenomenal drop shot bait. Well, the crosstail, when it's rigged this direction, really doesn't do anything. Right. It just kind of helps, you know, it's yeah. just there. Yeah. But if you rig it this way, it actually causes tail lift. Right? Yeah. So it helps the bait act more like a bait fish this way. Right. It has tail lift and tail That'll wiggle. Damn. And then it has a bulb on the tail because there's a bait called the Berkeley hit worm. Yep which is arguably one of my favorite drop shot baits because okay. it causes like a shimmy. Yeah. Like not a hard kick like a swim bait, but just like a wiggle. Yep. But no one drop shots it. So instead of just adding like a round, like flat, thin taper, yeah. like the twitch, yep. I was like, let's make it have a, a ball, like a half a bulb. Right. Well, what it does, this one is, it, it causes when that water runs over the bait, 
it shimmies, it shimmies really hard. So what makes it great that's is like so crazy. you can swim, you can roam and Ned. Yes, it's like <laughs> yes, but I'm in <laughs> legit. You can roam and Ned with this thing, and that tail will will shimmy. Yeah, you can put it on the back of an underspin, and that tail will shimmy. And Dude. so many guys take a Mega Bass Haze Dong, yeah. which is a small body swim bait, yes. and fish it around current situations because it's got a small tapered swim bait tail right. that will shimmy. Well, this will now do that in current. So you wow. don't have to have 10 bags of drop shot baits to do all these different things. It's literally here. You just got to pick your color. You pick your color, right? So there's 12 different colors. Um, really, it's really unique, man. This is just like... That's so cool, dude. I, I'm so proud that you of you for coming up with that whole thing. I hope that he's making it right for you rather than he just is, giving yeah. you a bunch of for you. Here's your free bait. Yeah, so <laughs> just really cool process, man. No, like that's seeing so it all, exciting. right? Like I drew it. it yeah. Um, we sent it to the CAD guy. Yeah. We got the first CAD rendering back. And yeah. we're like, oh, that's ugly. Yeah. It's so ugly. But like you draw it and you send them millimeters and sure. It, it was ugly. I mean, make it sexy, like extend the body a little bit, right. make it sexy. Um, send us a second version. Okay. Like, oh, it's still kind of ugly. Like can't be four inches long because we well, don't realize what a four inch bait is. Right. Huge. Huge. Yeah. Huge. And like this tail section in between uh, the cross tail yep. was so long that the bait would just like flop around. Yeah. So they made it sexy. Um, and we got a version very similar to this. Okay. We tested it out and. You did well. We were like, <laughs> wow. Like, the tail. Like, I knew it would cause it to shimmy, but I yeah. didn't realize it'd be good. Like, right. that good. Um, when you put it underwater, it has different action upside okay. down. Didn't think about that. Yeah. Right? Like, it was just, it happened to be because flat side and bottom causes right. it to glide. Now right. it makes sense. So when you went into the development part of it, did you know that that was going to happen when you created it? I knew the benefit of a bait like the magic flick where it yeah. is round side on bottom okay. causes it to roll. Okay. But I thought the fins would stabilize it. Yep. Like I literally thought it would have very similar action on both sides okay. with the exception of the glide. Okay. Like I knew it would glide. Right. But like. So there was crazy. a couple things that, that kind of shocked you a little bit. In yeah. The creation and and like, it. I didn't realize this, but buoyancy on plastic is weird, right? Yeah. It's, it has no salt. So it's, naturally buoyant sure rigged with the flat side down the tail because it's thicker on the bottom piece yep. it floats okay like this right yep. it'll want to float up but because there's more plastic on the top side when it's rigged this way it will swim yeah like this because it wants to sink right but then once it gets down too low it floats back it, it like swims That's cool dude and we didn't realize till lloyd sent us a video in the tank like yeah. testing it both different directions. We're like, right. why is it sinking that way? And he shook it and the tail went back up. That's so but wild, dude. On the Gobi side, it just literally, like, you can't help but it, it'll sit like that. Ugh. It's yeah, like some of it was luck, and a lot of it was like, let me take the components of my favorite baits right. and make them my yeah. own. So, like, these are probably my three favorite colors yeah. um, Real Shad, Sandman, which is like a Gobi inspired yep. color, yep. and then Old Ben. Which is uh, <laughs> you just had to get your name in there, <laughs> yeah. So Alex Rudd actually came up with that name. Oh, really? That's yeah, cool, like, man. The name Minobi is a combination of Minnow and Gobi. Sure. Right. So yeah. Then he's like Minobi, like Kenobi, and I'm like, right. oh heck yeah, like yeah, old Ben, old Ben, <laughs> Ben Kenobi. Yeah. He's like, you have <laughs> goes to have back a to color the, goes back to your ben. nerdier nerdier movie oh, years. We're so nerdy, <laughs> but yeah, dude, it turned out better than we ever could have expected. Um. I just, like, now that I've been through the process, yeah. I'm like, man, why didn't no one say, like, hey, if we're going to imitate a bait fish, like, yeah. pour the color different. Yeah. But oh, also, cool, why didn't no one ever say, like, hey, this shad-shaped worm, I can imitate a goby if I just flip it the opposite direction. Right. Uh, it's just crazy, but it turned That's out really so cool. so cool, dude. Man, I'm so excited for you. I hope. And these these are... Have these even been released yet? They'll come out on the 20th. On the 20th. So this is like pre. Couple days. Nice, dude. Yeah. That's so awesome, man. Yeah, it's been a fun, fun process. So this means you get to quit your job, right? Again. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> like, this will make me 
like beer money. Yeah, there, there you go. There you go. Yeah. That's no, but awesome. we'll get we'll get some royalties. So if like people buy a pack of baits, that you know I get paid. So sweet, dude. It's really I'm cool. so excited. I want to get out. I'd love to come out and fish. We haven't fished together in so long. It's it's literally. I felt like it's been years. And it, it has well been. Could be. It has been two years, Josh. It? Yeah. Because the last time we went was around the spawn when we went up to Tawas and the Charity Islands. That's right. That's right. God dang, man. Why has it been so long? Well, you don't think. Like, it, what's crazy is you don't think it's been that long. Yeah. Then it's like uh, six months had gone by, and you're like, man, I yeah. got to reach out to Ben, or I got to reach yeah. out to Josh, and we no, and that Yeah, and that just goes back to, like, when we way earlier in the conversation where we were at in our lives, and, you know, I think last year, the last couple of years, I've been so consumed with with Kevin, our youngest there, playing baseball, that, like, summer times were just like, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Or, like, yeah, I'm fishing, like, Instead of three times a week, yeah. I'm fishing like three times a month. Month, right. So it's yeah. like, yeah, you're chasing oh, wait, your little hey, girls Josh, down. You want to fish? And yeah. it's like, oh, wait, I'm busy that uh, one day that you're going <laughs> yeah. this month. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just crazy. We just got to, we just got to find the time. So anyway, well, dude, this has been great. I'm so happy that you were able to come over here and yeah, talk about you. this. And I'm ex- super excited to see these uh, baits come out. And yeah, Excite, Excite Baits is the name of the company. Yeah. American made. American made, all American poured in made. Texas. It's even better, man. I love it. I love it. So no, thank you for having me on. Yeah, this is uh, it's really fun to see like this content, yeah. like the way both of our content journeys have yeah. kind of progressed. Like you didn't know how to edit a couple of years ago, and then no, you basically I said, didn't. "I want to learn to edit because I enjoy yeah. hunting and yeah. I enjoy filming." No, and now I enjoy telling stories of this. Right, right. like we have two cameras set up. Yeah. A it, it is crazy, cool. Yeah, it, this whole podcasting. I still like. I don't know where it's. I don't know where it's going. I just. I love doing this, and yeah. I love sharing it with people. And and if somebody can get an ounce of information and take it, like to me, that just makes me super happy. Yeah, super happy. So, and uh, yeah, this is great. So I'm so excited for you on these things, and I, I wish you continued success with this stuff and. So how can a person find your channel? Um, on YouTube, it's www.youtube.com yep. slash Benjamin Nowak 10. Okay. N-O-W-A-K 10. Okay. That'll take you to my YouTube channel or just search Ben Nowak. Just search Ben Nowak on yep. YouTube and it'll and give you, you can, <laughs> all listen, social you platforms. can go first. You could spend an entire <laughs> year watching videos. You can watch me grow up. Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> you, you can could. literally watch me grow up for the last 10 years of my life yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, that's incredible. Is there anything else, any, um, anywhere else? Somebody, I mean, you're on social media, you Instagram, stuff like that. At B-R-N-O-W-A-K okay. underscore fishing. Yeah. I'll show up on everything. Okay, YouTube, sweet, Instagram, sweet. Instagram, Facebook. And you do a little bit of podcasting as well. A little bit. Yeah. Um, ventured into it a little bit. It's just Just kind of on a hiatus right now with it. Yeah, yeah, it's fun when you can ever just hang out and talk, right? Yeah. Some of what. For I enjoy sure. the most and kind of what we talked about is like talking and hearing people's stories right. or hearing people's fishing adventures. Yeah, so for sure. I know on the last podcast I did, I talked to, uh, you know, my buddy there, uh, Marcus about doing almost like a, not a semi live, uh, you know, hunt, but I think it would be super cool to go out on the boat and do like something like this. Yes. A podcast almost, you know, I mean, obviously well, the cameras would be involved. So then I guess it would become a YouTube yeah, it'd probably just be YouTube at that but, point. But. but what's cool, right? And Dirds and I have talked about this a lot. Some of the most fun pieces of content to watch because we're all nerds of some sort. Yeah. Like for us, it's fishing. Is when guys are sitting at fish camp. Yeah. And they're sitting around either talking yeah. about their stories. Yeah, for sure. Or their experiences, like Greg and Bobby and all yeah. their cra- the crazy boys, fishing man. stories yeah. or yeah. your hunting stories. Yeah. Like the most fun on those trips is sitting around having the conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, having something like this set up where you can just hear people talk right. and the passion of it all, yeah. like, it's no, really fun. It's super valuable, in my opinion, and I, I really, really enjoy it. So, well, I mean, we're pushing two hours, so that's people that are awesome. either gonna people are either gonna love it or they're gonna <laughs> turn it off in the first couple of minutes. These guys are a couple of ass clowns. So either way, <laughs> one or yeah. both, or both. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I think we're gonna call it a day on this one, guys. Again, thank you, Ben, for coming on. I yeah, super appreciate you. it. Uh, I wish you much, much success. Uh, 
you're probably one of the nicest guys I know in the in the, the whole bass fishing YouTube industry, and you're always easy to get a hold of, and you always respond back to everybody that that has ever reached out to you, myself included. So oh, thank you. There's a that. lot of value in that these days. So, but with that being said, I think we're going to call it a day, and I appreciate everybody coming on and listening. This is the Miked Up Outdoor Podcast. We'll see you all soon. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.